So we're now going to move again to take a slightly different tack, and I'm extremely grateful and uh, very delighted that three um, ladies are going to come and speak to us about their personal experiences of long QT syndrome, how it you know has has or hasn't uh, affected them at all in their lives, and I think this will be this is much more the sort of the personal aspect of the condition and how they've um, incorporated it into their daily lives uh, rather than the sort of the nitty gritty of the molecular biology and the things we get excited about. So I'm delighted to ask um, Caitlin Morse and Michaela Gagney-Hetzler and Dr. Elizabeth Egan to come to the stage and each give their little experiences. Thank you very much. Can I just make a quick housekeeping note while they're coming up there? Um, we have coffee and tea and cookies and fruit um, out in the, uh, in the atrium area. So um, we'll continue the presentations, but just wanted to offer that if anybody needs a refresh, uh, they're outside for you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> all right, so please bear with all of us, I think. I don't normally talk to this many people, nor do I talk about something so incredibly personal. So thank you for inviting me, actually, to speak about this, because this is something that's very important to me and my family. So oh, there we go. I'm guessing I hit this. Nice. OK, so this is my story that, with a very large picture of myself. Um, but this is me before. This is before. I started a family. This is before I knew I had long QT, too. This is before I'd ever heard of anything like this. Um, this was me finishing the, my first marathon. This is the Boston um, Marathon in 2005. I'm wearing a shirt bedazzled for me by my sisters. Um, and th this photo is symbolic to me because running was something that was really important to me growing up um, and into my 20s and now even still. But it's something that I did, and it's something that I identified with. Um, and it's something that I still do. And so now, even more so because of the long QT, it's more than just exercise to me. It's about perseverance and dedication and determination. So, all right, so here's my discovery. When I was 29, I was living in New York City, <clears throat> and I had gone to my regular annual physical. And my doctor happened to do an EKG as part of her, her just routine exam. I had no prior history and no symptoms or anything to be looking for this, but she happened to do the AKG and we found my long QT on there. Um, the one difference when I had gone to see her at this point was that I had recently gone off birth control, because I was going to have a baby, um, with my husband. I wasn't pregnant yet, but we were you know, thinking about that. So we think that maybe um, the prior EKGs I'd had with her, just still part of those routine exams, maybe that my birth control pill hid that. It's one of our thoughts. Um, so obviously I panicked, and I felt like a ticking time bomb, which I'm sure many of you who have this also have felt that way. I was suddenly petrified of an event, and I'm long QT too, so walking down the streets of New York City, there's a lot of loud noises. There's a lot of like, potentially terrifying things. So I felt like I was just ready to explode at any point. Um, I was afraid of my own body, which was a really scary and really unnerving and kind of betraying feeling. Um, so I cried a lot to my new husband um, and to my parents, to my siblings, to basically anyone who would listen. Um, we did a lot of talking, a lot of reading up about what this was and what it meant, um, and a lot of speaking to specialists. So I had tests and scans and more tests with more specialists, um, and I had genetic testing to confirm that it was long QT2. So I began my beta blocker therapy at that point and then started having the big conversation about an ICD or not. So one of my doctors was really pushing for the ICD because I had fairly long um, intervals on my, on my EKGs, plus my lack of symptoms just made her nervous. So she was pushing for it. And we went to see a bunch of other um, doctors for different opinions, and my second, third, and fourth opinion all didn't think that an ICD was necessary. So after weighing the pros and cons, we decided not to do that, um, and we moved forward as confidently as we could um, with our lives and tried not to think about it every day. And then we moved on and had Miles. So this was my first baby Miles. He is, I had a wonderful pregnancy with him and he is obviously chunky and adorable. Um, I stayed on my beta blockers through this entire pregnancy and I was monitored incredibly closely through um, the entire thing, including labor and delivery. And thankfully all went well. And he was born on his due date, um, Christmas Eve, um, 2010, and he was perfect. So in his first few months, we had him a couple of EKG, EKGs done with him. Um, 
and they were all well within the normal range, so we felt fairly confident that he didn't have this. We discovered also that there were so many other things to be anxious and worried about with a newborn that we tried to just put it out of our minds, and we were still living in New York City, so again, many, many things to worry about. So as people do, we packed up shortly thereafter and moved back to Massachusetts to be closer to our family. And then we had Ben. So two years later, we had Bennett. So sweet Bennett was also another great pregnancy. I was also on my beta blockers throughout this one. Um, and Bennett arrived a little early in that awful snowstorm last year, um, Nemo, uh, on February 9th, 2013. So, but when I looked at him, I just knew he had long QT. I just knew this was my long QT baby. Because um, he just looked so much like me as a baby, and he, I could just see my whole family in his face. So we had him tested really early on, and this first EKG was normal. It's actually when I met Dr. Abrams, <laughs> that day one of Bennett's life. Um, his first EKG was normal, but it was pretty close to the, like right at the edge of that range. So we had him genetically, genetically, genetically tested as well, um, and that came back positive, as we expected. So at the wee age of four months, he began his beta blockers as well. Um, and the wonderful people at Children's really helped us through all of it. Um, he first started on beta blockers with the, their infant like drops. It was three times a day. And now he takes half a pill in the morning and half a pill at night. And he's 21 months, but he's a champ about it. He picks up half his pill, puts it in his mouth, and swallows it down um, with milk. He's 21 months, though, so he sometimes gives us a hard time about it just because he can. But we have to like negotiate about it, and I have to offer him a, a sugary vitamin afterwards. But he takes it, um, and he's wonderful and healthy. Thank God. So this is our family <laughs> on the beach. Um, but this is us. So we had Miles genetically tested as well, just in case. And thankfully, um, he is in the clear. Though when Amy called to tell me the news, I still cried on the phone. But this, this is something that we deal with as a family, just as any other challenge that we meet. Um, Bennett and I have to take our medicine, and we do every morning and every night. But we try not to make a big deal about it. And we're, we're very careful about any medications that the boys take, myself included. And we always check with um, Amy and Dr. Abrams, even I, when I know that it's OK. I'll just check anyways to be super careful. Um, and we're going to let the boys kind of come into their own. We aren't going to restrict anything for Bennett at this point. We're just going to see kind of where he goes, like what he's interested in, what he's drawn to. Um, and we just decided that we're not going to set any hard and fast rules at this point, which it's very happy to see that that seems to be the way that um, the research is going. Um, but we've, we've learned that with life and parenthood and everything like this, that we can make our plans, but we just kind of have to obviously go with the flow and react appropriately if we can. Um, this is just another picture of our family because we still run. So we run shorter distances. This is us at the, um, after the Falmouth Road Race really sweaty. Um, it's in August. It's really hot. Seven miles. But um, so they're shorter distances and much, much slower times. But we run and we do it as a family because we want the boys to know that it's good to run and it's good to be healthy. And when we get older, we'll have the conversation about what this, what long QT is and what it means. But we just really don't want them to live in fear. So we want them to be smart and aware of this and thoughtful. But we want them, of course, to be healthy and we want them to be kids and have fun. So we want them to run one step at a, as, at a time for hopefully a really, really long time. And that's it so far. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to speak from here, Elizabeth? Is that? So I'd like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Egan to the stage. Thank you. So, unfortunately, I don't have slides today, but you guys can admire the beautiful running family during my speech here. Um, so, I'm here as a long QT patient of Dr. Doss, and my daughter, who's three years old, is a patient of Dr. Abrams. And I'm also here as a representative of my larger family, um, because we've come to learn over the last few years that long QT has probably affected our family for four generations. Um, and our family is affected by long QT1. So um, I'm just to give you a sense of our family, I'm one of six kids. My father is the oldest of 12, and his father was one of seven. So you can imagine my first appointment with Dr. Abrams was kind of long as he's trying to draw out the whole pedigree. Um, so every family has its rules. And growing up, one of the rules in our family was that we weren't allowed to hold our breath underwater while we were swimming. And this was something my dad, who's a physician, is in the audience today, told us. And the reason was because 
1966, his 12-year-old cousin, Patrick, held his breath too long underwater and he died. And the explanation was that he just held his, held his breath too long and his lungs stopped working. And that, you know, that could happen to anyone, so we really shouldn't do that. So even though we wanted to play those games like other kids do, see who can swim the longest underwater, et cetera, we kind of were always cautioned not to do that. So flash ahead to three years ago, and one of my first cousins was in the hospital in New York City about to have her first baby. Um, and there were some abnormalities on the fetal monitor as happens relatively frequently during pregnancies. She ended up giving birth to a healthy, beautiful baby boy. Um, but postnatally, she had an EKG that was done on the baby just to make sure that everything was okay. Um, and they were initially told that the EKG was normal, but even before she was discharged, the cardiologist came to visit them, she and her husband, and started asking questions about whether or not any child had suddenly died in the family. So you can imagine you're sitting there with your brand new baby um, thinking everything is fine and this line of questioning was pretty alarming to them. Um, but then they were discharged and the assessment was that things were probably fine but they should follow up in cardiology clinic. And with that follow up it became clear with a Holter monitor and more questioning that the baby probably had long QT syndrome and he was started on propanolol within six weeks of birth. Um, and along with that came, you know, potential for low blood sugar and having to make sure that not only you're feeding your new baby like every other parent is freaked out about, but also, you know, having this medication on top of it, which can make things worse. So um, he ended up being tested genetically for long QT1. Um, and he was really the first true identified case in the family. This is about three years ago, as I said. And from there, his mother was tested. That's my cousin. She's positive. Her mother, who's my aunt, is also positive. And that um, woman is one of 12, so that's my dad's sister. And out of those 12, um, all of the girls, so six girls are all positive, and one of the boys is positive, although several have not been tested. So um, it's definitely running through um, the family and a lot of individuals in my generation and my kids age uh, have not yet actually been tested so there's a lot of open questions still. Um, so how, uh, how it's affected me I think is really colored by personally the story of this young boy Patrick who's my dad's cousin who died when he was 12 and just a few weeks ago in preparation for this for this conference I called his sister who's now a woman in her early 70s and lives in Ohio. And she really relayed to me the story of what happened that day. And basically, the family was on vacation in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And they had pulled into the hotel, and they were going to have dinner. But before dinner, everyone wanted to go for a swim. They had, I think, eight kids in their family, but only four kids were with them on this trip. So they went for a swim, and Patrick dove in on the deep end swam all the way underwater to the shallow end in a, you know, a modest hotel pool and stood up. And then similarly, his brother behind him dove in, swam all the way underwater to the shallow end and stood up. But when the brother stood up, he noticed Patrick was no longer standing. He was under the water and he just didn't look right. He alerted his father who was right there. His father's actually an internal medicine physician. Um, they pulled him out of the water. Uh, he vomited once, and then his eyes rolled back in his head, and as, as his sister told me, he just never breathed again. Um, he was taken to the hospital, and they worked on him for several hours, uh, but he never regained consciousness. And the explanation at the time, he had an autopsy that was, showed nothing, and the explanation at the time was that um, his lungs just stopped working. Um, so uh, his sister told me that her father and her mother actually kind of their whole lives were always wondering, you know, what obviously, as any parent would, what actually happened here. And they, they have very strong um, Catholic faith and they articulated that they thought once they went to heaven they would finally figure out what happened to Patrick. Um, so it's really just been in the last few years that I think we're all kind of finally learning what actually happened to that to that young cousin. And um, for me personally, uh, I was diagnosed in the context of my cousin's son being diagnosed. Um, my EKG showed a prolonged QT interval 
But other than that, I've not really been personally affected. Um, I was prescribed beta blockers, and my three-year-old was also diagnosed and prescribed beta blockers. Um, I think I'm fortunate to be in this kind of like asymptomatic category otherwise, and I don't know how many people in the room feel the same way, but I really don't like taking the beta blockers. Um, they don't make me feel that good, but you know, I view this all in the context of you know, this boy in our family who died, and it's a little bit hard for me to ignore that reality just because I don't like this medication. Um, for my daughter, who's three, she actually, thus far her QTC interval is normal, although her chi waves look a little funky, so, and obviously she has a genetic mutation. Um, but one of the questions I'm kind of, that remains in my mind and where I feel like there, there does need to be more research is like what is the risk stratification? If you're obviously a three-year-old with a really prolonged QT interval, that may be a different risk from a three-year-old who doesn't have that. And, you know, do all kids just get treated the same or is there some way, you know, with further research to sort that out? Um, the other thing that's come up in our family, just uh, we're scattered all over the country, as I'm sure a lot of your families are, and people are seeing a lot of different providers, obviously, and the recommendations from these providers just are all over the map. Um, and I think that's just another area that's really been pretty hard for our family because, you know, from my sister who had a normal QT interval who was told she probably needs an, an implantable device to my adolescent cousin who had a prolonged QT interval, male cousin, and was told, oh, they can just monitor by serial EKGs. Um, I feel really fortunate to be, you know, in the program here because, I mean, obviously these are some of the leaders in this field and um, I trust them, but I, I think hopefully more and more there can be education among cardiologists, um, even general cardiologists, to kind of promote a more cohesive message both about sports as, he were, as we were hearing but about therapies um, because I, I feel like that's still really an area of big confusion among you know the people who are dealing with this so so we'll now hear from our third uh, patient parent and um, then we'll have some questions afterwards Michaela Gagne Hetzler thank you very much thank you does anyone else want to go out and get a zebra fish for a pet today? Because I'm so fascinated with that, for the record. <laughs> um, so, Let me paint you a picture. Just imagine you're 15 years old, full of energy and full of life, and there's nothing in the world you love more than the thrill of athletic competition. Soccer, basketball, track and field, it's your passion. You love to fly, to run so fast and breathe so hard that in that moment you feel like you can accomplish anything. It's that moment you live for. After a long and grueling practice one day, your high school coach pulls you aside, looks you in the eye, and says, you can coach a player to have skills, but not to have heart. You are great because you have all the heart in the world, and you're really good at it. You're a record-breaking, varsity-lettering, three-sport captaining athlete, and all you want is to compete for the rest of your life. So there you are. It's an unusually hot Saturday morning in May and you're standing at the starting line to the biggest track race of your life. The 10 hurdles are lined up in front of you, taunting you to conquer them. On your mark. You shake out your legs, feeling the presence of the amazing racers on the side of you, but you know in your heart you're the best. Get set. You put your feet in the starting blocks, heart racing, blood pumping, energy screaming, go. You're off. As the wind whips in your face, you take the first hurdle by storm. Hurdle two, three, four, no one is by your side, you lead the pack, the adrenaline only rocks you harder. Hurdle five, six, you feel a wave of dizziness, your vision begins to slightly cloud. Hurdle seven, you feel yourself slow down, realizing you can barely see ahead of you, your head is ringing. Hurdle eight, you continue to take on the hurdles by memorization only. You have to finish the race, you're going to lose, but you're going to finish. You wish you could feel your legs. All you can feel is your heart pounding. Hurdle nine. The lightheadedness is overwhelming. You know you're almost there. You can hear your mom screaming up ahead. You have to finish. Hurdle 10. You stumble over that last hurdle, catch yourself, and stagger to the finish line. You fall to your knees as you try to overcome the moment, head to the ground. The officials are reading off the results, but all you can hear is your mom shouting for you as she rapidly approaches. 
She's rubbing your back, asking you if you're okay. You hear the trainer asking you to say something. Your vision is returning. You're okay, you have to be. The dizziness is gone. You can see the gravel near your face. You slowly stand up, trying to push off the hands helping you. You need to hold your head high. You need to be okay. You just lost the race that should have been yours. The look in your mom's face is undeniable. I'm fine. This is my story, my experience. During my senior year of high school, two years after collapsing at that finish line, my world as I knew it came crashing down. A diagnosis of hypoglycemia was followed by randomly detecting mitral valve prolapse never noticed before. Some additional cardiac follow-up led to genetic testing, and I'll never forget the day I was officially diagnosed with long QT. It was Good Friday of the year 2000. My mom turned to me with tears streaming down her face, still on the phone with the electrophysiologist who had just received my genetic results. It had taken six months, by the way, at the time, and they were expecting more like two years. It broke her heart as much as mine, the woman who always cheered on the sidelines as my greatest fan. No more basketball until the streetlights came on. No more racing my friends on the track. No more hopes for Division I soccer. No more dreams coming true, the dreams of that little girl who wanted nothing more than to compete for the rest of her life. Not only was my true passion taken away from me, but I was told I'm a ticking time bomb that could go off at any moment. I was confused, angry, sad. And at that time, in the year 2000, I could barely find any information on my syndrome and found virtually no support with regards to meeting other young people with heart conditions. Despite the amazing support of my friends and family, it was the most alone I've ever felt in my life. No one truly could understand what it was like to feel as though you were no longer yourself. But I was alive. I had been given a chance. And with the resiliency that youth are inclined to possess, I decided to concentrate on what I had, not on what I didn't. So I did what anyone would have done. I entered a beauty pageant. <laughs> and yes, that is supposed to be funny. <laughs> Especially if you knew me then, OK? I know what the stereotypes are that are associated with beauty queens. And when my guidance counselor suggested it to me, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, back then, I would wear my ratty jeans and you know my old sneakers, and I probably wouldn't brush my hair. And I'm, you know, so it was really funny that he thought I would be a great contestant for Miss Fall River. So I did it. I thought it was a good dare. Um, it was a new form of competition to, weigh the, to fill the void left by sports. I certainly love a good challenge. So I walked into that Miss Fall Over 2000 scholarship pageant. Um, I almost threw up before my interview. I couldn't breathe during my weird piano talent I had at the time. And um, I definitely walked like a football player in my, in my swimsuit and heels. And <laughs> my mom was so proud. <laughs> but the funniest part is I actually loved it. Um, it was an unexpected adventure. I enjoyed the ride, but I loved it most because during the program, you're given time to speak to the judges regarding a platform issue. So I told them all about long QT syndrome and young people were dying and people didn't even know what this stuff was. And um, it was this therapeutic experience to really be able to talk about it and, and the work that I suddenly realized I wanted to do. At this time, I was a senior in high school. I threw myself into my academics. Um, I'm an artist. I was in student government, did all this stuff, got into you know, um, Commonwealth College at UMass Amherst, and it made me feel great to know I could accomplish so much um, and mean something to others, even when I couldn't participate in that one thing I thought most defined me, being an athlete. So one month before entering college, um, I had my first ICD implanted, and I brought toys. Wait. This is my first one. I'll pass it around if you want. I did sterilize it, don't worry. But uh, <laughs> They're much nicer shape nowadays, so if you want to. I thought about turning it into a necklace, but that seemed weird. I don't know. But I always carry it with me. It's kind of like that good luck charm. But I am super lucky, because this is one of the old ones they used to implant, like in you know the abdomen and stuff. Like talk, I'd be, I'd go around and be like abs of steel, like telling people to punch me in the So I'm eight years into number two and uh, awaiting the alarm to start going off on me that tells me that my battery is going and that's going to come really soon, I hear. Um, I didn't go on to play Division I soccer as I hoped, but I did develop that pageant in my blood, uh, proudly display displaying the scar on my chest that the athlete in me has always insisted was a war wound. I, um, I returned to the stage a couple years into college and started thinking about pageants the way I thought about sports. It was this determination and this personal effort, and I started winning, and it was really crazy. 
crazy. And while I was winning these pageants, I was hearing more stories about young people dying and athletes dying unexpectedly. And in media was kind of finally, he you were hearing about these things. And um, I started being asked to tell my story about my heart condition. And at first it was like, what story? What do you mean by that? Um, and then I, and I realized by sharing my experience and telling people about what I was going through, I was educating people. And, and people were realizing that like heart, heart disease doesn't discriminate. It can happen to any of us. You're not going to pick the young woman in a room as having a heart condition. So um, I decided it was time to do more and say more. I went to the Massachusetts State House, um, began work on bills that would make ADs mandatory in schools. Sadly, we have not passed that yet in this state, but it is um, nationally, it's going places right now. So we, we will win that battle eventually. Um, for those of you who know about Kayla's Law, they are mandatory in our state in um, health clubs and gyms. Unfortunately, uh, Kayla Richardson had to uh, pass away on a treadmill in a health club in order for that to take place. But I work very closely with her mom, who's done some great work. Um, so in, in June of 2006, uh, shortly after I received my master's degree in mental health counseling and art therapy, I returned to um, the Miss Massachusetts pageant, and I won. And it was crazy. And um, wait, hold on. <laughs> because who else wants to see this anymore, really? <laughs> Dr. Naomi, she likes this, right? <laughs> Everyone around my house is sick of it, so <laughs> might as well bring it somewhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, they, t they tell you your heart can race from playing sports, but man, if you win a pageant, whew, it is off, you know? <laughs> Should not be allowed. Um, but it was cool. I went in 2007. I actually got to compete in the Miss America pageant in Las Vegas, and that was wild and crazy. And um, everyone always says, "Oh, that must have been the most amazing part." And it was awesome, but it wasn't the most amazing part. Um, some of the highlights were, you know, I, I had an email. I ended up my story was like in C CNN and USA Today. Oh my God, this girl has a scar on the stage, and she's going to walk across the stage in her swimsuit with a scar. And I was like, Psh, "It's awesome," you know, and. Um, it became this big deal. So this lady reads about me in USA Today, and she says, uh, you know, I, I'm supposed to have a defibrillator implanted, and I have not had the courage to go through with it. And then I thought, hey, if Miss Massachusetts can do it, so can I. And she ended the email with, thank you for saving my life, Michaela. And I mean, forget the Miss America crown. Like, that that was awesome. That, that was definitely the best part. Um, it was great. I ended up becoming a national spokesperson for the American Heart Association for the Go Red for Women campaign. Uh, done a lot of work with Parent Heart Watch. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar, they were. It was founded by uh, four moms who lost children to sudden cardiac arrest, and they're doing great work nationally. I mean, there's a real great foundation of parents nationally who are just doing tremendous work, whether it's in the state house or getting screenings done and whatnot. Um, they're doing amazing stuff. And I've done a lot of work with SADS as well. And if you haven't heard of these organizations or gotten part, uh, become part of them, learn about them because they are providing tremendous support and education. Um, I love all these groups. I love the people I've met. I certainly love my work. But the best part has always been nationally speaking to children and uh, young people who have heart conditions and, and defibrillators and ICD um, and um, pacemakers. And, you know, I always encourage them to view their syndrome with a new sense of hope. And um, heart disease doesn't define you. That, that's always kind of the message. But it's not every day, you know, you get to compare scars with an eight-year-old who's had open heart surgery or um, at Camp Meridian when I had this five-year-old was like, that's so cool. Miss Massachusetts has a heart problem too. And that was it. I was in, you know. So, um, so it's basically, um, it's been a journey, uh, one that certainly never ends. And I certainly didn't think I had my life mapped out in this way. I would thought I would be in the NBA before I thought I'd be, you know, in a Miss America pageant. But, um, you know, it all, in the end, I've, I've, I've found it to be something I'm fortunate that I've experienced, and uh, it's made me in a, into a woman I'm very proud to be. Um, currently, I'm a licensed mental health clinician, and I'm a school uh, adjustment counselor out in Fall River at our public high school and an art therapist. Um, I'm a mom, so I have four children. Two are biologically mine, and that certainly brought about its own series and challenges. And um, I want to recognize my mom right now because all the stuff that I went through as a kid, she probably went through just as much because here I am, you know, sometimes being rebellious and being upset and now as a mom, understanding what she went through is crazy to me. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think my faith has helped me be strong and accepting. I can only take on the challenges presented to me and, um, you know, not fixate on those what-ifs that always seem to come consume us in life. So. 
for those of you out there who have um, these types of obstacles you're going through, I hope my stories helped a little bit. And um, that being said, I say embrace it all. Embrace what you have as part of who you are. Uh, being a survivor hasn't been a, as much about the physical aspects, but about the psychological and emotional ones. So make sure you're taking care of yourself in that sense, whether that be outlets, whether it be you know arts, music, um, whatever you can to find that healing within yourself. Um, and in closing, I can say I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have a mom and dad who pushed to find answers, lucky to have doctors who cared, and certainly lucky to be alive. We should all have that chance. Um, and you know, my story is meant for many reasons. It's one to encourage everyone to appreciate their qual positive qualities and shortcomings, continue forward in your life no matter the obstacles. And um, you know, I can think of no better cause to fight for in life. So when I tell my story, it's in the memory of those who couldn't be saved. So thank you. three fantastic and incredibly personal stories and I'd like to thank all the three speakers for being so kind as to share them with us today. It was um, really, really touching as the physician to, to sit here and listen to those very personal accounts. Any questions from the audience for any of the speakers, any of the three speakers? Yes. symptomatic. Um, when I had gotten dizzy that line, they still chalked it up to maybe it was hypoglycemia. They weren't really sure what happened to me that day. I'd had a few fainting episodes in my life, but they were typically associated with needles. One time was in church. Again, they weren't really sure, you know, uh, where that was. I was borderline. Um, so they gave me the choice, but um, they told me I wouldn't have restrictions if I got one. So I know this is a little like different than probably a lot of other people have gone through. So I chose to get it and you know a lot of 17 year olds aren't looking to like have a scar and a raised box into the skin of their chest, but I wasn't like a lot of other girls. So um, I did do it. So I, I was given no restrictions in terms of um, being able to compete and whatnot once I had it. So it was a bit of a process in terms of trying to decide that, but it was always, that was pretty much my clear path. I felt like if, if I can keep myself safe, this is go for it, you know? Yeah. I have not been shocked, yay. 14 years later, I haven't had an episode. Um, I mean, those of you who are considering an ICD or maybe don't know as much about them, I mean, the technology is unbelievable. I mean, I'm at home and I can hook it up to my phone and they can track what's been going on with my ICD. I go in, these put these crazy machines on it. They can tell everything that my heart has done in the last six months since I've been there. So it's, it's really, really cool what they can do today. Any more questions? Yes, question that. As best we know, there's no um, issues related to them in the long term. They've been used for many, many years, and we don't see any problems related to them. They can all have short-term effects. Um, when we treat younger children, they seem to tolerate them very well. And of course, we don't know if um, they would be different off them. Um, but we don't see any um, obvious long-term effects that sort of creep up over many, many years that we're aware of. Um, we do, definitely do see side effects. Some people feel very lethargic on them. One of my old professors in London decided to take them just to see what it was like. You know, so I think it's, there are definitely side effects with them. They're not, you know, no, no medication is perfect and is free of side effects. So, but we don't know of any sort of long-term issues related to growth, related to mental functioning. We don't see that over the long term. But it's a good question. So they do seem to be just as safe and successful. 
they first came onto the market in about 2008, maybe 10. Um, and they were, um, the trials came out, they seemed to be effective. The big advantage was is that nothing goes inside the heart. So they're all outside the heart, all around the chest wall. So one of the things we worry about is infection and it's, it's much easier to take that out if we need to and it doesn't get into the heart. Um, they do seem to be, they are particularly good for conditions like long QT syndrome because often if we put an ICD into an 80 year old, they may need all the pacing and all the other sort of things that it can do. So all this does is just a defibrillator. Um, they're not for everyone, so we have to screen patients beforehand and they've only been out approved by the FDA for the last 12 months. So they've not been out in the US nearly as long as they have been in Europe or in other places. Um, they were started up by a startup company, a small company, have now been bought up by a big company. One of the problems at the moment is the, gen is the size of the generator. Michaela showed you one of the old generators and they're a bit like that. And because they need a lot more energy to shock the heart because they're outside the heart itself. But the, you know, the company who now own them are working very hard to get the generator size smaller as, a, as their first priority. So I do think for the right patient, they are, can be very, very effective. Any further questions for the three speakers? Nothing at all. I'd like to thank you all again very, very much. It's incredibly kind of you.